Bonsoir à toutes et tous. Euh, on est très heureux de vous accueillir euh, ce soir euh, pour notre premier invité euh, de l'année, euh, Chomo Bossé. J'espère que je prononce bien. Euh, donc Chomo fait partie euh, de ce projet que nous avons construit avec l'Institut d'études avancées, le lieu unique, l'École des Beaux-Arts et la ville de Nantes. Euh, ce projet a démarré en 2023. Euh, il consistait à ouvrir, à créer une résidence artistique internationale qui relierait euh, l'ensemble de nos, de nos structures et unirait nos différentes forces et spécialités aux uns et aux autres. Euh, donc nous avons convenu de lancer ce premier appel à candidature il y a deux ans maintenant autour de la thématique art, société, euh, art, mutation, société contemporaine. L'idée était d'inviter des artistes plutôt des régions du sud du monde euh, qui viendraient dialoguer avec euh, les chercheurs en sciences humaines et sciences sociales et sciences aussi tout court euh, qui sont invités chaque année au sein de l'Institut d'études avancées. Euh, pour nous, euh, l'important, c'était effectivement de pouvoir euh, euh, ben, aller vers des régions euh, qui souvent euh, euh, apparaissent peu finalement dans nos programmations, vers des artistes qui peut-être ne seraient jamais venus en France et même à Nantes et qui puissent euh, s'inscrire sur le territoire et travailler à la fois avec les chercheurs de l'Institut, mais également avec nos étudiants et puis avec le lieu uni comme un lieu à la fois de réseau, mais aussi euh, de diffusion euh, de leur travail. Donc on a constitué un jury qui compose l'ensemble de nos, de nos structures, de nos institutions, pour que chacun puisse être aussi force de proposition et de choix dans le, le, le choix des, des artistes. Donc chacun a, a candidaté avec un, avec un projet, avec un dossier. Et Chomo a été celui qui était finalement qui a séduit, je crois, tout le monde et qui correspondait au, à, nos, à nos aspirations et à nos modes de fonctionnement aussi aux uns et aux autres et sa proposition rejoignait à la fois le travail de recherche euh, très exceptionnel que vous menez au sein de l'Institut, le travail de recherche aussi euh, à la fois plastique mais aussi théorique qui est conduit au sein des écoles et puis euh, ce que l'UNIC aussi propose comme lieu d'expérimentation, de production et aussi de, de diffusion. Donc euh, voilà en, en quelques mots notre chaire. Dire aussi que Souliman Bachirdian a fait, nous a fait l'honneur d'être le parrain de cette chaire. Donc on est, on est très heureux de ce parrainage et de cet accompagnement et euh, que nous continuerons à travailler. Alors on a, on a fait ce choix de tous les deux ans euh, pour nous permettre aussi d'avoir un, un appel à candidature qui dure suffisamment longtemps et pour pouvoir toucher un maximum de réseaux et un maximum d'artistes aussi plus, plus éloignés de nos, de nos territoires. Voilà. Donc je vais passer la parole à Sophie Allard. On est très heureux de t'accueillir, Sophie. Tu viens de prendre la direction adjointe de l'Institut d'études avancées, qui a une direction collégiale, ce qui est un mode aussi de gouvernance assez original qui vous est propre. Et tu vas nous présenter rapidement le travail de, de Chomo. Merci à tous. Merci, Rosanne. Bonsoir à toutes et à tous. Euh, au nom de l'Institut d'études avancées de Nantes, je souhaite à remercier nos partenaires sur justement cette, cette chaire artistique qui nous permet de recevoir euh, Chomo Bossé aujourd'hui et pour une durée de six mois. Chomo sera basé à l'Institut jusqu'à mars et il aura donc, comme le disait Rosen, des, des moments d'interaction de, avec nos chercheurs, mais aussi avec les étudiants de, de l'École de supérieure des Beaux-Arts de, de, de Nantes-Saint-Nazaire. Donc nous sommes ravis de, de pouvoir donner une continuité à cette, à cette chaire artistique à travers de cette deuxième édition. Euh, je souhaitais vous présenter Chomo. Euh, son, son parcours très rapidement, mais également euh, le projet qu'il portera au cours de, de cette résidence à, de, de la chaire artistique. Chomo est né en 1990 à Midnapore. Il est basé à Calcutta, en Inde, et il reconstruit des matériaux d'archives et des histoires orales en photographie, film, archives alternatives et livres d'artistes. Recourant à des pratiques hybrides, mêlant recherche située et de longue durée auprès de communautés locales et création, il met en évidence certaines expériences à la fois subalternes et réfractaires dans le Bengale post-partition. 
Chomo a reçu la bourse de la Magnum Foundation pour la justice sociale pour son projet Full Moon on a Dark Night en, 1900, en, 1900, pardon, je me trompe de siècle, en 2017 et a reçu le prix public Louis Rudder Discovery aux rencontres d'Arles pour un autre projet A Discreet Exit Through Darkness en 2023. Il a également reçu la bourse d'art contemporain indien de la Fondation pour l'art, bourse Amol Badera, le fonds d'agroécologie, la bourse de livres de la photographie de la Fondation Murtinayak, la bourse de la Fondation Henri Luce et la bourse de la Fondation indienne pour les arts. Son projet « Where the birds never sing » a été sélectionné comme meilleur livre de photographie de 2020 par PH Museum et présélectionné pour le prix du premier livre de photographie Paris Photo Aperture Foundation ainsi que pour le prix du livre de la photographie Lucie 2021. Ses œuvres font partie des collections permanentes du Musée Royal de l'Ontario, la Fondation Ishara Art, du Musée d'art Kiran Nadar, des Rencontres d'Arles, entre autres. Vous pourrez également retrouver un certain nombre d'écrits critiques euh, sur le travail de Chomo, principalement en langue anglaise, je crois, sur Art Forum et, euh, et d'autres euh, 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 médias spécialisés. Vous pourrez retrouver toutes ces informations sur le site internet de Chomo. Très rapidement, le projet qu'il porte dans le cadre de cette chaire artistique s'intitule « Nous devons parler à voix basse ». Il s'intéresse à des cas récents de suicide en Inde. À partir de références trouvées dans des études de cas, des lettres de suicide, des archives de journaux et des souvenirs oraux, Shoma voyage dans divers lieux en Inde pour explorer ses histoires. Son appareil photo agit comme un enquêteur imaginaire capturant des lieux tels que des ruelles sombres, des plages désertes, des hôtels abandonnés et des institutions vides. Ces images créent donc une archive alternative du suicide, reflétant, reflétant une, une exploration et une possible mémoire des personnes concernées. Je crois que Chomo aujourd'hui va nous parler de son œuvre de manière générale, mais je voulais contextualiser ce projet qu'il développera euh, lors de sa résidence à Nantes. Merci à toutes. Bienvenue Chomo. Um, thank you so much, both of you, um, for this beautiful introduction. I hope you have said some good words in French. Um, so, um, yeah, and thank you so much, everyone, for coming here. Um, I'm so sorry that the presentation is going to be in English for another one hour. Uh, I hope that I'm not going to waste your time. <laughs> um, so, um, We can start. Uh, should we put the light off? Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Anthony. Um, mm -mm, okay. So, um, first I'd like to talk about, like, um, why I put the name, image, as an alternative archive. Um, so uh, it's very important like how I see photography or image uh, or the video as archive or as alternative archive. And that is how I think my uh, practice is now. But when I started like in 2010, 11, the time like when I start working with photography and archives and text. So I never thought about this word, but I more grew up and more I think this alternative word came to my mind multiple times. It's mainly because um, the time we are going through, uh, the internet and how the technology is also changing in the last 20 years, I think it's kind of important for me like when in 90s or 80s or all the photographs I see, it's kind of we always believed the photograph as an evidence, as an archive all the time. Because, you know, like even if at that time the dark room, um, I don't know what exactly word, like what I do in Photoshop, like the editing in dark room or like changing something or removing some face was possible, but as because it's technically very like difficult for a person to understand, that's why like, 
it never came to anyone's head that a photograph can be also fake. Um, so more, I think this idea came like after 2010 when the internet came and then the Instagram, WhatsApp, Facebook, people also start sharing fake images and also sometimes like images but with a alternative text, like which is not from the same place. And for that reason, in many cases, like many communal violence also happen in India, like for this WhatsApp message, like forwarded to many, many people. And from there, actually, I also realized that the archive I develop, I work is also I should start using this alternative because my practice is more is creating archive from our own memories and um, and this archive is also not the real archive. It's what I am creating and what I am thinking of. Um, so I will um, show mainly the two projects I did in last five, six years. Um, but I want to start with this project, its name, um, Let's Sing an Old Song. This is the very early project I did. And here I want to talk about um, how my practice started. Um, so so I, I, I was always like from the time I start understanding about time, I was chronophobic all the time. So chronophobic is basically a kind of a depression where you continuously think about losing your time, like your present is becoming past every moment and you feel that you're gonna lose everything, like the people and the moment and the everything you have, and you you continuously think and get yourself depressed. From there, actually, so my practice is very like organic because my practice started not from like after starting in a school or any formal way. So the first stage of my practice was like archiving my own people in the family. So this project started in 2010, 11, where one of my family members was in this folk theater form named Jatra. So Jat this entire project is about Jatra, which is a folk traveling theater form in, was in, in United Bengal, in Bangladesh and in West Bengal. And so my uncle was part of it and my grand uncle was also part of it. And um, so when, um, I grew up, I have seen many Jatras, and all these Jatras are mostly from the mythological character. But it's also interesting, like it also have um, very interesting history, not only like where the characters are coming, like from the mythology or from the historical, but it's also like in Jatra, men used to play the female characters most of the times, because when the Jatra started in India till I think 1960s, 70s, Women were some not allowed to play a female character in Jatra, so that's why men used to play the character of Jatra, the character uh, in this performance art. Um, so this is like, uh, I, what I did is basically like, um, so Jatra vanished from the art form of Bengal from 1970s, 80s. Still there are, which is mostly like the amateur Jatra, but not the professional one anymore. So. That was the first time what I did. I started looking for the artists who were very famous in 60s, 70s, 80s, and asked them to play the same character they played the last time in their life. Uh, and that is how the project developed. And this is my own uncle on the left side. Um, so this is like I did for three, four years. And then I start working with the other projects. And this also helped me somehow in my own psychotherapeutic way that I start gathering archives for my family history. And then slowly I moved to this um, project named Where the Bus Name. I did another project also in between, which I'm not showing, uh, because also we have a limited time. And I also don't want that people get asleep after listening to me too much. Um, so, where the birds never sing, I started in 2017. It's a project about a massacre happened in 1979 in an island called Morichapi, which you can see now. And this island is, um, so it's called 
So the island is in the Shundarbon area, and the Shundarbon is basically uh, around 300 islands, which is like shared by Bangladesh and India. So in 79, 31st January, uh, the government killed around eight to 10,000 people, what the many academics said, um, over a night. And from then, in 40 years, government destroyed all the possible documents. They hide the incident very well with only saying the two person died in the massacre. Um, there is not proper news about it and as because it was an island, so it is also easy for them um, to restrict to enter the island. And they also turned the island as a tiger reserve forest. Shundarpun is also famous for uh, the uh, Royal Bengal tigers. So they turned the island, but it's not all the island is only the tiger or the animal sleeps. There are like human and the animals like stay together in different islands. Um, so I like to say a little bit about our partition history. I think then it will be more easier to understand what happened. So all we know, like 47, the partition happened. And then the 71 was the Bangladesh war, where the Bangladesh born as a country separated from Pakistan. So. Before the partition, the West Bengal, where I live in Calcutta, and the Bangladesh was together one Bengal. Uh, and after the partition, it became a different country. So when it became the different country, only because of the religion, different religion, so people start moving from Bangladesh to India and simultaneously from India to Bangladesh. And when these people move to India, so there is like kind of, um, you also can see the differentiation between the caste. So the upper caste who already had the money, so they somehow got the space in Calcutta or the city or the big town area, so they were well settled. But the lower caste people who couldn't afford land to buy or they are mostly like coming from agriculture, fishing or some daily labor job, so when they moved to India, either in 47 or in 71 or in 55, during this time period, the government gave them a place, Indian government, which is in the central India. Now it's also kind of interesting that the central India, and they are also signed a document when they're crossing the border, and all they cross the border by force, like either some riot happening or some really violence by the police or the, by the government. Uh, or the local goons from the political party. So when they moved to the central government, the central part of India, these people realized that this location is not at all good for agriculture, which was their profession for 40 years, not good for fishing, and also not, going, not good for daily job or daily labor because the language is also different, and different means it's totally different. It's like... Um, French and Hindi, because no connection, like you can't, because South Indian language is, the origin is different from Hindi and Bengali. So they struggled, and they always wanted to stay in West Bengal, which is the Bengal part of India. And I want to show you the map a little bit. Yeah. So you can see Bangladesh and India, and Shundarbans where all the islands are. So these people wanted to come back, and then there is a government in 1977. Uh, this government promised them if they come to the power, um, they will invite these people to come to stay in West Bengal. And when they came to the power, um, without any official invitation, these people also have to know lower caste, and also their education level is very low, like maybe standard four or three, Kind of. So without an official invitation, they start coming to West Bengal. And then they realize that they want to stay near this island because it's very good for agriculture and it's also good for fishing. Um, and it's also somehow the weather and everything is connected, like feels familiar like where they stayed in Bangladesh. So they wanted to stay there. Around uh, from the official record is 30,000 family moved there, but the government 
the new government and the central government said no you can't stay here you have to go back because the government also wanted labor not citizen for india and the idea was like they will cross and they will do free job for the government like um cutting the forest making the roads so that's why they also don't want these people to be in sundarban so the conflict between this people people and the government started and the government also brainwashed the other people from the other island that if this migrant immigrants people like coming to your island then you also going to lose your job your business so you also have to help us to um put them back um so so this clash happened finally on 31st january of 1979 almost like um 45 46 years over a night the vacant the vacant the inter island and moved them back to the central india and in this process of violence um like obviously police firing economical blockade which is means like for 90 days it was there without food without water um without any medicine supply and then also the local goons from the political parties um looted their house burned their house tortured women and killed almost 8 to 10000 people from then it only remained in the oral history oral memories and the connection with this with my work is my family also came from bangladesh during the same time same period to midnapur which is another coastal area and i also heard this incident so many people in this region heard this incident but there is no documentation because there are few regional amateur sociologist work on it made published the book but um the government seized all the books all destroyed the books so there is very like rare documents which is available now So uh we worked on this for 4 years um mm, on the oral history I will show you the images now what I have made uh then we also published a book a name where the bus never sing where we put together the academic text um also political leaders speech which they gave in different places like translated and also um survivors and also like the images what i made is basically um in the island or maybe the opposite of the island most of the cases um so i want to start with this photograph so in the left is basically um nirmalendu dhari uh, you can see sorry on your right yeah on your right you can see the book and in the book on your left the person which is like in a black and white image in the center with the black shirt so i found this photograph in a newspaper uh from one of the archives and then i was looking for him after 40 years and then it took me like almost 2 years to find him and finally i found him and made the picture so the inter project is kind of took time to find all the survivors because it was like 40 40 years and in 40 years the people moved in different location the government changed multiple times so they didn't remain in the same location where they were in 1979 and so the process was finding them listening to them and then go back to the island and make photographs of their memories what they still have the same work what i did in the beginning but that was more like portrait based work this is more landscape and also portrait based work and I always tell about this work particularly that I am also not allowed to enter the island because it's a tiger reserve forest and there are tigers so legally I can't do illegally I can't do so the story is for me is that you are telling a story of a house without entering the house even like after 40 years you only are listening from the people who once stayed in the house from them about their memories of the of their time being in the house and then telling a story from this oral memories they are telling me about the island um 
so these are i will quickly go with the photographs um and we'll also tell about so this two person is one of the survivors um whom i found in the central part of india like in the left one the person i found him central part of india and the right person i found and the um is a north um east of india so it's like they live like around 500 kilometers i think from each other but it's also interesting process during when i was trying to find them because it's 44 years they don't know how to use google map i didn't have their phone number i didn't have any contacts only like some academic wrote something from columbia university living in new york uh, like some historian or maybe someone like um who is doing some other research and mentioned about mori chapi so i didn't have any names like whom i'm looking for i only have the memory that this incident happened and or maybe not happened because is also kind of because i born in 90 so i had also no idea i don't have like a i don't have not witnessed it so the story is also for me is kind of a fiction though is like for me every memory is a fiction so is a fictional story some people believe it some people don't believe it there are people who follows the government they don't believe it like it ever happened and then is like when i'm listening that i'm going to those islands looking for location and then making images like someone told me like the last uh when they are trying to escape and they have seen their house is burning and then uh the two person they have seen from very far and so this memories i st- start making in the island where uh the massacre happened or sometime most of the cases is the opposite island because i'm not allowed to go to the island like i try to find location in the opposite island uh is also giving some reference of the like place how it was is also kind of a place a uh, full uh, it's a mangrove forest and the high tide and low tide happen all over the like a uh, day and is also like a cyclonic zone the cyclone happens like every year at least like two times three times um so this is also kind of uh, some like photographs and then also like some letters i have collected so it is also interesting like when often see that we work on archives but then we also think that archive means there are already existing archives like as a newspaper archives or family archives or institutional archives right and then the artist is going to work with it but here the archive does not exist is the people who carries the memory or the people who carries the document with them and there's no official thing so i met them people and then they gave me oh you can see this later it was sent it to person who never received which is in 22nd January 1979 it means 7 days before the massacre happened and the letter is writing that uh i'm from calcutta and i have heard that something is going to happen in morichapi so be careful and the letter never reached to the person um and and then the person is also writing that uh, i wrote a letter previously i don't know like if you have received it or not um so this is i got from another person because the letter was never sent um then there are like people who showed me like who are missing and then also on the right one of the survivor but he was only like 9 10 years old so it's also interesting like it's also 44 years so the people i met maybe the last generation who witnessed the massacre if i am like late more than 10 years or 20 years then there will be no like eye witnesses like i can meet so this is how the work developed and i keep making photographs you can see like a leg uh, on the sand so this is like also people in different island told me um that they have seen bodies bodies parts like after the massacre and it's also easy like as i showed you in the map the island and then the indian ocean start so the killed and floated the body so the river automatically goes and the rivers are full of like uh, saltwater crocodiles 
So for them, it was also difficult when the police entered that they couldn't swim also back to other island to save their life because many also were eaten by like crocodile or other like shark, which doesn't have any records. Like we don't know. Um, then um, I wanted to um, meet the police, like who was um, in charge, but he didn't want to give me any like time. So then what I did, I literally asked many people like how he was look like, and then I made a sketch, and then I did the audition, and then I found a similar person who looked like the police officer, and then I made a picture. So this picture, like more of the photographs, also has kind of. Um, um, like actors who helped me also to develop the project. So it has the real survivors, actors, real location, sometimes also the fake location. And it's all mixed. And that's why I keep saying it's an alternative archive. And then alternative archive is becoming the only existing archive of the visual archive of the massacre. Uh, on the right side is a boat like uh, which police used uh, during that time is now abandoned. Mm, more survivors, one of the survivors is showing like um, there's a bullet wound behind uh, his head uh, that I think you can see, yes. Um, yeah, yeah, I can see in my computer, but I can't trust sometimes the projector that if it is showing the same. Anyway, um, yeah. And then um, this is one of the later I translate into English and uh, which is one of the rep survivor uh, who um, wrote the letter. The police was not accepting any kind of complaint or affair against anyone. So they, um, so she wrote the letter to the Refugee Union of India, and I got a copy, and then I translate, and you can see the date in below uh, the hand stamp, which is like 7th February 1979, like seven days after the massacre happened. Uh, I d of course, I deleted the names, and also the hand is basically my stamp, but in also you can see like the handwritten letter like behind my uh, English type. Uh, yeah, so this is how the project, um, yeah, and this is like the Ministry of Rehabilitation, the certificate. In my book also you have uh, used one of the original rehabilitation certificate with the government gave to the people who crossed the border because it's also like they didn't have the passport so this document was the only document they had when they're crossing the border and they forced them to write that they don't want to live in any area in India where the people speak Bengali so they have and then they also abide by the law that they are not doing any agriculture job in India and that is written in documents and also in our book uh, and yeah, and then um, many told us like they went back after a few years, um, like their family members went back to the opposite islands and then wait for them if like, because it happened like very happily, like the police entered and then the vacuum and many people moved in different places. And many people lost also their family, which I realized later because I traveled in different part of India to meet them and realized that this person is maybe telling the same story of the another person I met in another state, another city of the same family. So maybe they know each other, but they are not connected. And then some people remarried and a different family because they waited for long, like three, four years, because there's no death record, there is no official documents. You don't know your close one died or not, or maybe many people also came back later. Um, so yeah, so you also made a picture like someone is waiting. Um, and then I tried to put together all the archive, like, I mean like from the family album or someone has like a picture in their wallet, so, or some newspaper, like took a picture of something and then someone told me oh this person was my father this was my son and then i put together all the pictures like possible after 44 four years to uh, that who are missing till now so we can say that but we can't use the date because we don't know um so there are also a video a film we made um which is like all the survivors are talking about um, 
and then the exhibition part starts. Um, so we did like a um, couple of exhibition, uh, I think we're doing for the last five, six years, like traveling the work all over the world mostly. Uh, but I want to show this is the first exhibition we did in Calcutta, like where I live, where my studio is, where I work from. And um, so we put down lots of information on the wall and also the video where the survivors are talking directly because many people also raise the question like how this work is actually valid because because I always say that my archive is alternative. But I also needed some of the evidence that the people are telling. And I think I'm... If I don't do it now, then nobody will be able to do it later because we never know like you will be able to find them again or they're alive because all they are in their 70s or 80s. Um, but uh, so this is like some installation shot, like how we did the exhibition. And um, then this interesting things happened. So after we did this show in Calcutta, then we also realized that we should do a show um, in the opposite island where my work is mostly made. And also like some of the survivors still live there. So we went back to the island where the massacre happened 44, 45 years before and made a public installation and, um, and all in Bengali. So we put like big, big prints on like boats, like someone's paddy filled and uh, here and there. So I'll show you this one minute video, like documentation of what we did there. जानते हो साये ना जे ये टा की होये सिलो की बीता हम तो सुंदर बने परोवर्ती जोन में जारा आज भी तारा वो जानते बार भी एक बीच बहुत सर आगे ही रखों दुर्गाटो ना घोड़े सिलो सुंदर बने लगा After we did this, then uh, um, this installation setup also traveled to different part of the world, like London, New York, and other places also. And then we also loved like how um, the memory which government wanted to erase from our head and from the documents, from the history, because this never also in the any official documents or even if in our history that this incident massacre ever happened in India, but. After like we start showing the work, of course, like we also got like some government threats, but but it's interesting that we we somehow was able to make something like um, which is like opposing to erase from the history of our like subcontinent. Um, so yeah, and so this is the work about the massacre and. Now I want to talk about um, a different project I did named Discrete Exit Through Darkness. Um, um, okay, I hope you are not sleepy, right? Okay, yeah, thanks for some noise. Uh, so, um, the previous work was more, mostly connected from my further side family who came from Bangladesh and the stories I heard from them, the memories I heard from them and I always wanted to like to keep some archive from my own family roots because I don't know actually where they used to stay in Bangladesh but I always heard that they stay in Borishal and Borishal is also the places where all the people came, mostly the people came from Borishal who was the night when the massacre happened. So I found this 
through this incident to archive something for myself, for my family also, for my next generation to know that where they came from and what happened and how much, because we often talk about the partition, but we never discuss about how welcoming it was for the people who crossed the border. We always say what happened before the crossing the border, but we very few times discussed after crossing the border. So that is, is the project about. Now what we're discussing is very like uh, personal uh, family history, but I also think this work is not too much personal. Um, so in 1969, 24th October, coincidentally, 24th October 1969 was like um, Lokhi Puja, is like a festival, like worshipping a goddess, Hindu goddess. The same day is also today, but it's the 16th October because we follow the Bengali calendar. But it's the same day, like today, where the full moon was there. And my mother went missing for three consecutive years from then, from that date. And my grandfather was looking for her in this time, and then he died after one year. And my grand, my grandfather and my mom never saw each other, never. Like um, the story, like my my mom was rescued. Um, two and a half years later, like three years, we can say. Um, and she had this um, psychological problem, still ha have, uh, she has, uh, prosopagnosia, where she can't remember the incident much. And she was only nine years old then. Um, so, and the family also didn't speak about it. And they also tried to erase this incident from the family history because they always thought it's not good for her. Um, because you also have to like get married and other life, etc., etc. So they always hide it. But now she is in her middle sixties, and um, now me and my mom during the COVID time we discussed and realized that this is a very really important uh, incident for our family to document and is is not only like important for my mom, but we realize that there are many others who also went missing during the same time uh, from Midnapur. Either they were like trafficked or like um, used as domestic help in someone's like in family and all. Uh, so, so, um, so then I start working on it and then I realize that I have only one picture of my grandfather that is this. Like, I don't even know how my grandfather used to look like. So I have to develop a story. Like, Mori Chap, you still have some eyewitness and survivors, but in this case, like, nobody knows a single thing. And there are few people, like, who are in their 90s, because my grandfather was the main person who could remember a little bit about it. But he died, so the memory is missing from them and my mom can't remember anything so i have to develop a story without nothing uh, there's a picture of my grandmother and my grandmother holding my mom in her lap i erased my mom's face because the work doesn't have any like doesn't have my mom's face in the picture and there's no picture of my mom actually i have also ever taken for this work um, um so so what i did what i did i actually met, did interview of a couple of people. And then I went back to the neighborhood um, where my grandparents used to live, my mom's side grandparents used to live. And um, I realized the house actually they used to live that demolished the house because there is a folk story that my grandfather, or before there was like similar, my grandfather become a ghost and he keeps coming back to look for his daughter every like full moon night or something. And that's why like um, they realized that it's not a good thing to have the house anymore, so they demolish. So the house is also not there. It's a house like I heard from them and then I tried to find similar house from another neighborhood. 
So I start making uh, photographs. One I did is basically try to do the interviews of the people uh, who are still alive and can remember a little bit of it. And I made a fictional um, film from there, which is a 360 degree film, one hour long, which is more from my grandfather's side, like his search for my mom. And then he fell into this. Uh, so this 360 movie is basically like my grandfather is telling about um, what he is going through. It's fictional, but it's also sometimes some memories is coming from my grandmom a little bit and some of my relatives. And then slowly I also start, uh, this is my grandmom, uh, reenacted the memories, my mom's things, and also my mom's um, brothers and sister things. And also I start traveling the places where my grandfather maybe went and start developing photographs there, like the location. Uh, someone maybe told me, oh, I heard like he went this town to look for her. And because uh, someone got, gave him some tips and then um, he went there for, because he was looking for her crazily. Uh, and um, so, yeah, so I start traveling and making photographs and also I start making photographs of my grandfather, again, I took help from an actor. We did audition and then we found a similar character who looks like, maybe looks like my grandfather because I have not seen my grandfather. So, yeah, so we start also making, developing photographs from there. Um, yeah, similar photographs. But then we, I, in my all work, I also use um, some kind of the psychological state I am going through when I'm doing this work, listening from the people and, um, you know, trying to figure out like my own reaction towards the memories I'm listening from people. So this is like the one image I tried to think about like multiple times, like all these memories people are telling is different perspective and multiple people say it like, I have seen your mother for the first time. Um, yeah, and everyone, tell me like very like interesting story like this is how I found your mom and then I told the police so I still don't know what is the right thing and wrong thing I always feel like all the memories is inside a black hole and then I'm trying to figure out like mm, one one memories from there and so so this type of images I also make in my work uh, and then there is a photographs like how my mother um, imagined about her father's death and because because she also have not seen her father's death and then she keep telling me I see like you know old house and like a body was lying where the face is not visible because prosopagnosia is a disease like it's called face blindness you know easy word so so the work also if you see it doesn't have much face like I also erase it uh, intentionally and then this character, uh, Crow Man, was actually, it was in the film, in the 360 degree film, um, where we developed the character who is keep coming back and trying to figure out or trying to find the memories in the home and also telling the stories. And because this ghost, I realized, and it's, it's also interesting, like I always say that ghost is also another history like because the, all the ghosts is also carry some kind of memories some kinds of stories and that's how they become ghost and i found it super interesting because uh, that in india like every corner every old house has a ghost story and this ghost is also carrying all these um character caste problems um gender problem violence everything within the ghost and that is how the oral memories also stays with us and the history also stays with us. Uh, so in the film, we have developed this character and also used like the character is roaming around and telling the stories to the viewers. As because the 360, the viewers sometimes also feel that they are the ghost and they are actually roaming around in the house and telling the stories to others. Uh, and um, now I will... Um, talk a little bit about the research when I was developing the project. So what I did is basically I went to the police records, NGOs, um, 
uh, that who are parallelly missing on the same time period and what happened with them. And few, a few also I did interviewed and few I also did the case studies, but again, it's from the police cases. It's not like an archive, like not an official archive. And then from there, actually, I tried to develop the story I wanted to. Uh, and these are the installation, some shots, like how we exhibited the work. And then like the last two slides of the work. Um, so things we lost last night is the last chapter of the previous work. So I talked mostly about like the 360 film, which was my grandfather's perspective of the story, or more specifically, we can say the story of the family when my mom was missing in the family and what they thought, what they struggled. And then the parallel story is also coming in this, that story. And also, then I developed a three-channel film, which is the second chapter, which is my mom's perspective of the inter-incident. What she remembers and how, also like, she doesn't much about this three years, but how she is like lived the life last 50, 60 years with that memories from the other people telling her, because she can't remember. It's the other people telling her this maybe happened with you. Uh, so these three channel films also parallelly also I tried to put in the 69 is also kind of a time um, in India was very complex because all the communist movement started during that time, 67, 69, the Noxial movie movement also started there. So it was also one of the reason that when our family went to the police, my mom's family went to the police, so the police said like there are missing people in almost every house. So we can't actually like, uh, we can't promise you that we'll be able to find her. Uh, so the next slide I gonna play um, one minute from this film and then end, then please feel free to ask me any question. গামোছার পর ওকে খবরটা দিয়েছিলাম ও হয়তো তখনও প্রস্তুত ছিল না জীবনে ওই শেষবার মৃত্যুর গন্ধ পেয়েছিলাম সারা রাত্রি ঘুম আসেনি সকালে যখন হসপিটাল থেকে ফিরে এলাম শাড়ি খুলতে গিয়ে দেখলাম মন্দির ছাপের উপর এলোমেলো কিছু রক্তের দাগ লেগে আছে আমার প্রথম সন্তানের রক্ত হঠাৎ পাশের ঘরের ছোট জানলা দিয়ে কে যেন বলল এই তুই শানু না শানু আবার কে শানু নামে কাউকে তো আমি চিনি না দুটো আমারই বয়সী মেয়ে বারবার মুখের কাছে এসে কাঁদতে কাঁদতে বলে শানু তুই ফিরে এলি শানু এই নাম আমি আগে কোনো দিন শুনিনি কোনো দিনও না আমি তো মিতা Thank you. Um, yeah, if you have any question, I think it's good for all of us. So we'll not sleep again. Yeah. So please feel free to ask me any question if you have. I'm going back to the slide where I started. Mm, this maybe, yeah. Maybe this, yeah. 